Good evening, church. If you have your Bibles, if you'd open to Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. How many of you like to build things? Like to put things together? Uh, some of you even like Lego. And uh, seeing what you can construct. When I was a little boy, I enjoyed a thing called the Meccano set. And it was uh, little metal things with screws. And uh, I, I think... A lot of people in this world do like to, to build, but I think the majority like to enjoy what others have built. It's sort of like 20% do all the work and 80% enjoy the fruits of the 20%. But there's something special that people who build find out. There, there is such blessing in doing things for people instead of always having people do things for you. And so we have an opportunity in the next uh, few months to get involved in building. Now, I know that some of you, if you take on one more thing, you'll probably need to come visit me in the counseling room. But for those of you who haven't tried to get involved, and if you do have some, some time available, please try the humanity, uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity things. And I think, uh, Chris, it's the next slide. Uh, Chris? Chris? The, uh, the next slide can advance me one. There we go. All right, there it is. Now, that's an email that Keith Claskin sent out for an announcement. And it is basically on the, 5th, uh, on the 23rd of this month. It's been confirmed. And then on the 27th of next month, it's tentative. But uh, it, there is so much joy in getting out and doing something. Why is it that some of us like to do things? Why is it that some of us like to improve whatever God gives us? I think if you look at Genesis chapter 2, from verse 15, you'll see that God puts man in charge of his creation. He creates it and he says, okay, now I want you to work with it. And I think the part of God that is inside of us is that part that wants to do something, wants to put something together out of nothing. So we read here in verse 18 of chapter 2, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should live alone. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I will make him a helper fit for him. So there we have the word make, and we see formed, and we see uh, Adam is given a, a function. He has to call, he has to give them names. But, but that idea of God creating, God making something out of nothing, I think is what is inside us, where we, we really yearn to, to put something or to have something lasting in this world. Verse 19, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, and every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Then the man, sorry, verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So up to this point, what is the big deal about naming things? You would think, well, you know, anybody can do that. But it's highlighted to such an extent that you realize there's real work involved here. This just took real effort, and God is very proud of what Adam did. But as we see there, there's no one found to be a helper fit for him. Verse 21, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had, God had taken from the man, he made, there it's again, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And yet he calls someone again. He gives a name again. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Man, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. The Hebrew word for woman is Adamah. So you can hear very clearly Adam and Adama in the Hebrew, how you would find that, find that connection. So it didn't take a lot of imagination, Ken, for Adam to come up with this name. You know, good for him, you, you got it. But yet God seems to think that was a very important thing. Verse 24, Therefore a man, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were unashamed. When we look at the key points, we see here that the first thing we see is that there's a father-directed foundation. 
That is verse 18, a father-directed foundation. And uh, <clears throat> Jeff, we're going to leave it on this slide for quite a while. I'm going to go back and forwards talking about this slide. So the father uh, puts the, everything in motion. He gets Adam to name the names, and, and he sees that there's no one for Adam, and Adam is put to sleep. So God, God puts the foundation for the future for Adam. And then he, we see that the future is there in verse 24, where a man shall leave cleave. But then we see later on, they are unashamed. Uh, Bill, I appreciate it. I've got one. I had it hidden over here. Thank you. And then finally, we see this forgiving framework where uh, they're not ashamed, but later on, they will feel uh, some shame. So when we look at the Father-directed foundation in verse 18, uh, in Cain's prayer, he prayed that we would consider not the government, but the Bible. Did you, you all hear, hear that? And I thought, man, he, he was probably here while I was uh, talking this lesson through. Because that's exactly right. When you look at marriage, who created marriage? Who do you think created marriage? The courts, right? Because you have to go to the courts to get that document. Isn't that correct? Wait a minute. What about media? Did media create marriage? Where does this idea of marriage come from? I've heard it said a lot of times, and maybe you'll agree with this, it's a cultural thing. Is marriage a cultural thing? Where does the institution of marriage come about? Who created it? Then the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I, God, will make him a helper, fit for That's marriage, folks. That's where it happened, right at that point. So if we don't agree with our culture, if we don't agree with the media, if we don't agree with our courts, what should we do? Form a special interest group and run down to uh, Washington? Or should we judge each other inside this building? What do you think? Let God take care of the rest. See, I think sometimes we get in the way of God doing what He needs to do because we get all excited about stuff and we are counterproductive. Do you know who God is? Do you understand who God is? Is God always a nice being? Is He always kind? It's a scary thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is more than capable of dealing with people who want to redefine marriage because he has a vested interest in this, right? He started it. It's his. But what he asks us to do, according to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, let me see, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, don't judge those outside. What business have you judging those outside? Judge each other. So we need to make sure that all of us inside here understand what marriage is all about that God created marriage, and we will understand that this is a father-directed foundation. If we want to know what to do about marriage, we go to the father. What about counselors? When we need to know about marriage, are counselors good? What about our friends? Is it good to go to friends? What about books? Is it okay to read books on marriage? These are all okay, but it still doesn't take the foundation, take the place of the foundation. It can supplement it. I think when somebody comes and asks you about marriage, uh, what they're trying to find out is, what do you believe the Bible says about marriage? And I believe it's our obligation to go there. A friend was one day uh, busy putting together a, a, a pathway uh, to his house, and he was using very, very big stones. But uh, he thought, well, he's just going to get in there. It'll take him about an hour, even though the stones were really big. But he'll get, a, get them in pretty quick. It was a Saturday morning. It cleared his schedule. But his daughter said, Daddy, can I help you? Well, he didn't know what to do. At first, he said, okay, I'll tell you what, honey. You sit over there, opposite where I am, on that little chair, and you can sing for me, and that'll encourage me. But she said, no, Daddy, I want to work with you. So when it wasn't too dangerous, he allowed her to put her hand on the rock as he would carry it and put it in place. And eventually at that dinner table, this is what she said, with great pride, bursting forth. She said, me and dad made steps. <laughs> she was proud of it. 
And that is sort of what God is doing here. We like this little child that wants to work with God. We can't change the foundation. We must be very careful of how we work or build on that foundation because it's already been laid. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 9, he being a master architect, he being part of the apostles that helped with the foundation, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. He says, be very, very careful how you build. He says, some will build with wood, stubble, hay, others with silver, gold, precious stones. But at the end of the day, every man's work will be tested and we will escape as one escaping from fire. So we need to be very careful to understand this is God's marriage. This is God's idea. If you want to know about it, don't have your opinion. Do not have an opinion on what you think on any facet of marriage, on marriage, on divorce, on marriage. Don't have any opinion. Just open the Bible, read it. It says the same as what it's said for 2,000 years. Don't read into it. Just read it and see what it says. It's so clear. And then we have faith-directed future. And here we go down to verse 24, and we see that God's goal is to have a new family. He wants to create a new family. So what does he say? This is his formula. Look at verses 24 and 25 and see if you agree with me. Leave, cleave, and one flesh. You all agree? Leave, cleave, one flesh. Let's try, let's try leaving out one of those. Let's try not leaving. Let's say you stay with your mommy and your daddy and you want to cleave and you want to be one flesh. Will that work? How do we say abomination? <laughs> okay, that won't work. Okay, so let's say we leave mom and dad, we cleave, but there's no one flesh. Will that work? No. Okay, and then we do the other two and we leave out the third. Will that work? No. You see, it has to be a perfect uh, it's sort of like a circle. The, the, these three, all three have to be there or it's just not right. So you want to know what the, what the foundation is? God has created marriage and he said, use this. This is what I, and then you want to know what the future is? Uh, uh, how, how, how is faith going to direct into future? You just take these three things. We don't have anything else and we use them. So when we leave mom and dad, does that mean that we tell mom and dad, Sorry, we're leaving you, we, we're becoming a new couple, uh, and, and you've got no access to our family anymore. Is that, is that what he wants? Is that what leaving means? Oh, I see all the grandmothers saying, no, 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 we, we, we like our grandbabies, you're not going to do that. No, that's not what it means. It means you cut the apron strings. It means on an emotional level, you, you can leave. But it doesn't mean that you sever. And then when he talks about cleaving, a cleaving is a male and the female must complement each other. Uh, the children must complement the family. It means that you are, are glued in that marriage. In Matthew, 60, in Matthew 19, we read, What God has joined together, let what? No man put asunder. What God has joined together. God has literally glued this relationship together. I remember there was a man who went to see a counselor one day. And he had a list of complaints against his wife. After about two hours, the counselor managed to get a word in. He said, well, why did you marry her if she's such a terrible person? You know what the reply was? Well, she wasn't that way when I married her. So he has his conclusion. I like this. So are you saying that she is like this because she's been married to you? <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to hear that, right? We don't want to hear that. So we have the father-directed foundation, we have the faith-directed future, and then we have the forgiving-directed framework. When you look at verse 25, it says, And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There was no shame. But think about this in context of where we are in Genesis. Has the devil come to Eve yet? And told her, well, what did God say? And God said, you may not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Uh, you know, and, and then the devil says, no, that's not true. Uh, God doesn't want you to eat it because you will be just like him. You will know the difference between good and evil. So right now, we are in a time of innocence. Everything is beautiful. But did that last? No, it doesn't last. Sin comes into this world. And so what is God's solution? In verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, we find God's solution. It says, and he said, 
I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so immediately they realized something about themselves that they hadn't realized before. They had gained the knowledge of good and evil. It's like a, a little boy when he's around about 12, 13 years of age. So all of a sudden a bulb go, goes on or a light bulb goes on in his head and he says, you know what? I understand what the difference is between good and evil. Maybe I need to find out about baptism, right? At that point, when you know what good and evil is, you are a candidate for baptism. Now, just knowing what baptism is, anybody, any child can know what baptism is. Even a child whose personality has not yet been developed can know, know what baptism is, can know how important it is. But until you know, until you understand what Adam and Eve understood about themselves, not because somebody told you that, but because you really, in the core of your being, understand it, you, you are still innocent. But at that point, they've lost their innocence, and we know that they've lost their innocence because of what she says, because of what they say. And then verse 21, here comes God's grace. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments and skins and clothed them. And so what God has done throughout the time is he's clothed us. And in my reading through the Old Testament, I'm coming across a lot of references where God is talking about us being clothed and how important it was in the Old Testament for that to happen. And, and, and how, how much a woman had to clothe herself and how much men had to clothe themselves. And, and God demanded that. However, in the New Testament, what does he say? How do we clothe ourselves? We put on, we put on Christ. And so we, we, we have again that grace, that access, that access to God's grace. But think about it for a moment. How was sin different for Adam and Eve, as opposed for us today. When you look at Adam and Eve, you see, first of all, number one, they lived in a perfect environment. We don't live in a perfect environment, so we've got a lot more things to battle with. They lived in an uncorrupted society. What would it be like to live in an uncorrupted society? How many of you have wanted to protect your children and take them to a place where there would be no corruption? It's kind of like the world that Darwin and I grew up in. It was, a, it was, it was as pure of a world as what you could... Imagine your country, uh, I would say, 60 years ago maybe. That's sort of the conservative culture. Now, it was a Dutch reformed controlled culture, but still, even though I didn't agree with their theology, like you, you, my mother-in-law wasn't allowed to knit on Sunday because that was a Sabbath and that was work. But I still appreciate the fact that we could grow up. We never saw drugs. We didn't see anything. We didn't have TVs till we were 17. You know, I didn't even come to the country. So it, it, was a, it was a very different type of a world. Number three, there was no family influence that could be blamed on why things are going wrong. Also, number four, there was no sinful heritage. Number five, there was no ravaged surroundings uh, that could be blamed on their downfall. And then there are all the, the commandments that they couldn't, uh, they, they couldn't uh, break. Uh, number six, they, could they commit adultery? <laughs> couldn't commit adultery. Uh, number seven, could they steal? They couldn't steal. You can imagine Adam stealing from, from Eve. It wouldn't work, right? They couldn't steal from anyone. They couldn't dishonor their father and mother. How do they dishonor their father and mother? Okay, they couldn't do that. Uh, they couldn't bear false witness against their neighbor, and they couldn't covet their neighbor's goods. They had no neighbors. So there was a, it was a whole different thing. Yet sin is still the same. Right at its base, sin is disregarding or disrespect or defiance against God. And God cannot tolerate that. So let's now go to the next slide, and let's look at the application of the lesson. When you look at the Father-directed foundation... You need to ask yourself, who is in charge of your marriage? If, if you're upset with somebody, really, really mad at somebody, and you can't forgive them, is that going to affect you? Will it affect you if you can't forgive someone? Yes, as long as what you can't forgive somebody, you've got a, you've got a hold on that person. You're linked to that person. And, and, and it could be the last person in the world that you want to be linked to. You've got to forgive. In the same way, if you are linked to the, to the politics of this country or of the world or to the government or to the culture that you live in and you're mad at what they're saying about marriage, you are giving them time that they shouldn't have. You're giving them a, sort of a pulpit to preach from. 
God says, leave it alone. He'll take care of it. You worry about what we're doing over here. Are we doing okay? Ask yourselves that. Are we doing okay? Are we teaching our children about purity? Are we teaching our children about what a husband and a wife is and what a marriage looks like and, and what, uh, what beacon are we lifting up for them? Every time there's a golden anniversary, are we taking advantage of that? You know, are we saying, let's, let's just use our fellowship hall? Come here. Come have a golden anniversary year. We want to be part of it. You know, we, need to, we need to do those things, positive things. Instead of letting the negative stuff, and folks, I can get really down with what I see happening, and I realize who God is, you know? I just have to get on my knees and pray to God, and some people are in serious trouble. You know, God really would have invested interest in this one. This is one of those I really don't have to worry about. But I can teach, and I can preach, and I can fight for a marriage that I see is disintegrating. I can really put everything in it. And so are you... Uh, uh, part of a father-directed foundation. Secondly, when you look at the faith-directed future, are you becoming compatible? Are are you working towards being more and more compatible with the person that you're married with? Are your children becoming more and more compatible with the family that they're in? Or are you letting outside influences come in and interfere? Now listen, there will be family of origin things happen in life. Uh, Your parents will get older and your children will leave the nest. And there are going to be times, there are circumstances that we can't predict. Number three, looking at a forgiving directed framework, are you ready to accept the grace of God? Even in the pig pen, you remember what happened in Luke 15, 15 to the prodigal son? You remember what happened, what the Bible said? He did what to that foreign land? He joined himself. He glued himself. God doesn't want you to, to, yourself, to glue yourself to anything except what he says. Leave cleave, which is glue, and be one flesh and unashamed. That's God's plan. I've tried to uh, think about examples that we have, and we have a lot of examples of, of what marriage should be, but let's close with, with this example. This is a couple. Uh, there you go, the Hartwigs. I like the, the, the idea of the heart being in their, in their last name, the Hartwigs. That's Floyd and Violet. They got married in 1947, in August of 1947. You can see he's got his Navy uniform. He came out of the Navy just you know, to get married, and he was coming out of the Second World War, and this was the time for him to get on with his life, and they got married. They were sweethearts from high school, just loved each other. And eventually, when Floyd was 90 and Violet was 89, they passed away. Five hours apart, holding hands. Children came in, and there the parents were, holding hands. And, you know, that's such a, a wonderful example of what a marriage is. And, and, and you know, we, we all wish it could be like that for all of us. Uh, but, you know, you get really close to the person that you're part of. And, uh, and, and, and that's what it's about. And it's not something you can actually just come forward in a sermon and teach. It's something that has to be seen. Today, if you look at your, at your life, how are you doing spiritually? How close are you to God? How close are you, is your heart to building a, a family that is really strong? The church is only as strong as its families. And, it's, and, and the families are only as strong as the heart and the love that they have for each other. So how are you doing at doing your share today? If there is something that you could do to make your relationship with your spouse or, the, or your church family or with God stronger, what would it be? This, e- this afternoon, I went to the, to the colony and I saw a lot of people there and I, didn't, I expected maybe three, there were seven. And I thought, you know, I wish they weren't there. I wish all the kids had come and they'd taken all their parents out and they'd gone and done something, but they were there for the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and, you know, one lady was saying, yes, uh, my, my son couldn't be here. He was planning on being here, and, and, and Sissy she was so looking forward. Ken, you remember Sissy, right? She, she said that her son would be here today, and she had this whole agenda plan. Well, he didn't show, and she, she wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't there. And so there are some people that we are ministering to that are really, really struggling, and I'm proud of this church. But we can only do that if we're a strong family. So if there's anything that you can do today to make your family stronger, if you can ask for the prayers of the church, or if you haven't started that drive, you haven't become part of this family, there's only one way to have membership in this congregation. And that is if you 
Obey Acts 2.38. When they asked Peter, what should we, should we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 says, in that day, 3,000 were added to the Lord's church. Verse 47 says, and as many as were being saved were what? Added to the church. The Lord added to them to the church. And so if you want to be added to the church, that's how it happens. If we can help you with this in any way, please come forward right now as together we stand and sing.